Michael F. Judge. He was born to Irish Catholic parents in Brooklyn, New York on May 11, 1933. He grew up to become a Roman Catholic priest at the Franciscan Order of Friars Minor. And later, he served as a chaplain in New York City's fire department. He was also the first certified fatality on September 11, 2001, during those attacks. Upon hearing the news that the World Trade Center had been hit, Father Judge rushed to the site. There, he was met by the mayor, the mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, who asked him to pray for the city and for its victims. Father Judge administered the last rites to some lying on the streets and then entered the lobby of the World Trade Center North Tower, where emergency command post was organized. There he continued offering aids and prayers to the rescuer, the injured, and the dead. When the South Tower collapsed at 9.59 a.m., debris went flying through the North Tower's lobby, killing many inside, including Judge. At that moment, the moment that he was struck in the head and killed, he was praying repeatedly, very aloud, Jesus, please end this right now. God, please end this. Shortly after his death, an NYPD lieutenant who had also been buried inside the collapse found Judge's body. And assisted by two firemen and two civilian bystanders carried it out the North Tower lobby to a nearby St. Peter's Church. A photographer from Reuters captured on film the moment that Judge's body was being carried out of the rubble by these five men. You can see the picture in the corner is one of the most famous images related to 9-11, uh, The Philadelphia Weekly reported that the photograph is considered an American Pieta. Father Michael Judge was designated victim 0001, recognized as the first official victim of September 11, 2001 attacks. Other victims, of course, perished before him, including the air crew, passengers, and occupants of the tower, but it was Judge who was the first certified fatality because his was the first body to be recovered and brought to the corner on 9-11. 9-11, the numbers themselves in our culture represent to us emergency and response. As we commemorate this 10th anniversary of 9-1-1, we could focus on fear. The enemies are still very much out there. But instead, we will celebrate courage. We could simply remember all that we lost, but instead let us recall, at least on that day, what we found. We could talk about hate, the haters are still there, but instead, we will choose to talk about love. Jesus told his disciples on the last day that he was with them before his crucifixion at the Last Supper, John chapter 15, verse number 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Father Judge on that day was by no means the only first responder to demonstrate this greater love. As Nancy Gibbs said in her Time Magazine piece that she wrote some decade ago remembering that day, on a normal day, she said, we value heroism because it is uncommon. On September 11th, we valued heroism because it was everywhere. The firefighters kept climbing the stairs of the tallest buildings in town, even as the steel moaned and the cracks spread as zippers through the walls to get, people, uh, to, get to people trapped in the sky. She went on to say, we do not know how many of them died. But once we know, as Mayor Rudy Giuliani said, 
it will be more than we can bear. The sentiment was played out in miniature in the streets where fleeing victims pulled the wounded to safety and in every hospital where the lines to give blood looped round and round the block. At the medical supply companies which sent supplies without being asked. At Verizon where a worker threw on a New York Fire Department jacket to go save people. And then again and again all across the country as people checked on those they loved to find out if they were safe and then looked for some way to help. It was a day that impacted all who survived it. I'll never forget that morning. I was driving with my wife and daughters to men's prayer. It was our custom to arrive here early. After getting my wife and family up, we were a little late. And I clicked on the radio. And as I turned on the radio, I was listening to the fact that a plane, undescribed at the time, had hit one of the towers. While I was listening, thinking it was simply a tragic accident, I heard the, just the reporter describe the second plane go into the tower. I have heard before people talk about the Hindenburg. I'm a historian. I, I, I've heard those tapes before playing on radio of the tragedy that happened in New Jersey. But I had that moment right there as I was listening to my life change, to my country change, recognizing at that moment instinctively that this was not an accident. This was an act of hatred, an act of terror. And immediately, I remember, tears sprang to my eyes. My wife tried to comfort me. It's going to be okay. But I told her, something is going on. A few weeks later, I didn't realize how it affected me until my family and I made our way to Legoland to enjoy just a period of time, celebration of a family. There... Then, Legoland, there were small models. There's probably still there. Various cities all over the world, including New York City. Someone had taken down the Twin Towers from that model set and in its place left a small wreath. When I saw that, that little micro memorial, the closest I would ever get for a long time to ground zero. I stood there in Legoland and I wept again. I remember when I took young people to Washington DC, getting off the subway, running up the escalator and just touching the Pentagon. And then later when Brother Keck and Sister Priscilla Senior and Daryl and I rode the subway, stopping there at ground zero seeing that magnificent, horrible hole in the ground. Ten years ago, many of our local firefighters and officers went back to New York and the Pentagon to help with rescue efforts. The San Diego Police Historical Association came up with an idea to symbol the unity between police officers, firefighters, and paramedics. Today, many of them are wearing a special badge to mark the 10th anniversary of 9-11. You can see it depicted there. The badge depicts the Twin Towers with the number 343 on one, which is the number of firefighters who lost their lives, or 60 on the other for the number of police officers who died. The numbers are under the word united spelled out in red, white, and blue. But one does not need a badge to become a first responder. Remember the passengers of United Airlines Flight 93. After the flight was hijacked, Todd Beamer and other passengers communicated with people on the ground via in-plane and cell phones, which Again, when I saw one of those in-plane cell phones, I wept, realizing it was on Flight 93. But 
They spoke to people on the ground and they learned that the World Trade Center had been attacked using hijacked airplanes. Later, he told the operator that he was speaking to that some of the passengers were planning to, quote, jump on, unquote, the hijackers and fly the plane into the ground if necessary before the hijackers' plan could be followed through. Beamer then recited the Lord's Prayer with an operator. And according to her, Beamer's last audible words were, let's roll. But the spirit of the first responder was not born on 9-11, nor did it die with those aboard Flight 93, nor is it unique to the East Coast. Those of us that have lived here in Southern California the decades since will surely remember the fires of 2003 and 2007. These would include the Cedar Fire, which is the largest fire in California history, whose destructive past swelled to the size of half the state of Rhode Island. It killed 15 people, including a firefighter who among the hundreds took a valiant stand to save the historic mountain community of Julian. Don't ever forget them either. I remember Brother Richard, men from this church, I heard him sing so lovely, but men from this church who made their way up to the devastated community of Hillcrest ravaged by fire to help with clean up and to help rebuild. In 2007, the fires forced the evacuation of half a million residents here in San Diego. Many of us were reminded this as we made our way out of the darkness up the 15 to find the light up there in Temecula. In each and every one of these cases, firefighters, even more than I have the ability of talking about today, they work tirelessly to defeat their dreaded fiery foe. Sadly, fire is not our only enemy. The city of San Diego has about 2,500 police officers. One of them wore the ID number 6793, which ironically is the Strong's number from the Hebrew word for shield. His name was Officer Jeremy Henwood. He was 36 years old. He was a Marine reservist and had been deployed overseas three times and he had been with the San Diego Police Department for four years. Last month, he was shot and killed a couple of miles from here simply because he wore that shield. He was the second in the department to be shot in the line of duty in the last year. As Mary Jerry Sanders said, this tragedy is another grim reminder that our police officers put their lives on the line every day to protect our community, and we are grateful for their courage and sacrifice. Such courage and sacrifice is typical of our policemen and our fire rescue, of folks who serve this country in homeland security and in the armed services, and we thank you for your service. Luke chapter 15, Jesus ends his most familiar parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, with a question and with a command. The question is, which thou of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? We know the three that he's talking about. We know it's the preacher, that it's the teacher, and the Samaritan. Jesus told this story not to say that preaching is useless or teaching unimportant, but to highlight the fact that doctrine and dogma must be accompanied by deeds. When the lawyer replied, he that showed mercy on him, Jesus challenged him with these words, go and do thou likewise. From that time to this, the true followers 
of the lowly Nazarene have been trying their best to live up to those words. Go and do thou likewise. For every true believer, it is more than just a good idea. It is more than just a some sort of suggestion. For us, it is a command. It is our great commission. It is our life's goal. While standing there that day, talking to that slippery lawyer, Jesus was doing, doing more, excuse me, than just telling them to reach out to others. He was showing them. As he stood there in the sun of those dusty roads, he was demonstrating what it was like to reach out. For he himself was on a divine rescue mission. Brother David seen he was God manifested in the flesh who was running into our burning building of sin. They may not have understood that that day exactly who he was, but we should understand it today. As we sang on Tuesday night, the great creator became my savior and all God's fullness dwelleth in him. Not a surrogate, not an underling, but God himself became my first responder. Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will what die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died died for us. Thus Jesus becomes the first and the greatest first responder. In light of this, the church does not have the luxury of running from the issues and the challenges that confront a lost and dying world today. We must run to them. We must plunge ourselves into the burning building and pull those out of the fire. We must become first responders. It's not somebody else's job. If we see it, we're to do it. Go and do that likewise. You see the need. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher. You go and you do likewise. You get off your high horse every once in a while. You wallow in the mire and the grub to save somebody. Go and do that likewise. As Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, said in the midst of a bloody, our bloodiest civil war, almost 150 years ago, as he helped dedicate portion of a battlefield to become a cemetery. He said in his Gettysburg Address, it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That here we highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And in mimicking that and in the words of Todd Beamer, let's Roll, Anchor Church. Let's roll. 
Let's roll into our communities and our neighborhoods teaching Bible studies. Let's roll as we support our missionaries like the Simmons, true first responders. As we give today, today is She's for Christ Sunday. Let's give to move the gospel around the world. Let's roll as we, as we support Tabernacle Christian Academy. Let's roll as we support Tupelo Children's Mansion. Let's roll as we work on Miracle Monday and in prison ministry. Let's roll as we find again that solidarity we had as a people who wept together, who prayed together, who sang God bless America together, and who truly cared for one another. In conclusion today of my remarks, I leave with you a passage I read, if you could pull it up for me, brethren. It is Psalm 11. I go to the Psalms of tragedy and personal upheaval, emotional disturbances, because I find there are some parallels. The reason it's the longest book in the Bible is because it talks about emotions, and there is a large, very large spectrum of emotions found in the Psalms. Psalm 11 to the chief musician, a psalm of David. In the Lord put I my trust. I read this 10 years ago from this pulpit. In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul, fly as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their arrow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain stairs, fire, and brimstone, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous, the Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. In the middle of a song, as the musicians get ready to sing. In the middle of the psalm, the psalmist asks the questions. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It depends what your foundation is, David. If your foundation was economics, World Trade Center hit you hard. If it was just America, and I love my country, but if it's just America, then there may come a day when that foundation will be destroyed. I said, I love my country, but I love something even greater than my country. I have a foundation that's even greater than that. When your towers are rocked, where do you run to? As we remember 10 years ago, even the strongest Pentagon was under attack. What do we do when our towers fall? He told us in Proverbs, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. And so today I remind you, it does not matter. I thought what Justin said was so beautiful. Each of us have our own personal 9-11s. Each of us have our own personal challenges and struggles. And as we honor our country, and as we honor our nation, and as we honor those that serve, I think it would be appropriate as we stand together today to join our hands. Why don't you just link hands with somebody standing next to you right now? And we're going to pray for one another. You don't know what the future holds. As we found out the other night, you can have your Thursday night all planned out. 
only for some moron in Arizona to flip the wrong switch. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. <laughs> and everything, everything changes. Your whole priorities. And you sit and say, we could play video again. No, we can't do that. We could watch a DVD. No, we can't do that. We could check Facebook. No, we can't do that. Now all of a sudden, what are we going to do? And we're being humorous today, but just as easy, your world can be rocked. And in each one of us, we have personal challenges. But we need to, number one, understand that there's a God who wants to be your first responder today. I said, if you find yourself in a burning building of sin, he wants to run in and rescue you. And if you find yourself dumb enough, you found yourself in that building. Again, once you've been there before and he's dragged you out, I'm telling you, he loves you enough. He's going to come after you a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. Because long as there is life, there is hope. And I also want to tell you that there's a body of Christ that will love you. That in times of crisis, we join together and we'll pray with you. That's what we're symbolizing right now. Why don't you pray to the person next to you right now as we pray for one another. Don't pray for your own needs. Pray for theirs today in the house of the Lord. Father God, I pray that you would touch my brother or my sister. I pray that you would bless us. I pray that you would touch us. I pray, Father God, that your hand would be upon us. I pray for your strength and for your virtue. I pray for our president. I pray for our Congress. I pray for our governor. I pray for our mayor. I pray for our police force. I pray for our fire department. I pray for those in emergency services. I pray for our doctors and our nurses. I pray for all of those, Father God, that we can lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness. I praise you, Lord, right now that I'm a part of a great nation. I don't take it for granted one moment. I understand that freedom comes from you. Let every soul be subject to the higher power, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I thank you you've ordained that I'm a part of a great nation of the United States of America. We bless you, Lord, today. Let's celebrate our country. Let's celebrate being here. God today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. Bang. And then we saw smoke coming out and everybody started running out and we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people are jumping out the windows. Over there, they're jumping out the windows, I guess because they're trying to see themselves. I don't know. They're trying to create a fire break to keep the fire from spreading, you know, throughout the Pentagon, and it's been spreading from right to left, as you see the picture on the right, from the crater, and, it, and that's basically heading north, and uh, firefighters here are trying to get this thing uh, contained. When you're running like that, just in fear for your life, you have no idea how close that is behind you. And 
sewage just coming from every street. Look at that. This is one of those cases where the pictures really do tell the story that sort of the most horrifying aspect of this particular crash scene is how little debris is visible. There is a large crater in the ground and I'm hoping that you all are seeing it as I'm talking about it. But that's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. Here in New York have been hit by airplanes. In Washington, there, has, there is a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon has been evacuated. And there, as you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. Good Lord. There are no words. You can see large pieces of the building falling. You can see the smoke rising. The nation, the nation sends its love and compassion. God bless America! To everybody who is here. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for making the nation proud. And may God bless America. Come on!